Hi, I'm Nataki Garrett, and I am the Artistic Director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. OSF celebrates Asian Pacific Heritage Month with this panel, Breaking Stereotypes and Advancing Asian Artistic Leaders. I want to start by just acknowledging that the Oregon Shakespeare Festival is located within the ancestral homelands of the Shasta, Tacoma, and Latgawa peoples who lived here since time immemorial. Today, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians are living descendants of the Tacoma, Shasta, and Lagaos peoples of this area. So this panel brings together five artistic directors from across the Asian diaspora and across the country to dissect their cultural and social upbringing and share their personal stories, influences, role models, learnings, unlearnings that inform their own definition of leadership today. These champions of the theater are visionary artists, insightful activists, and inspiring organizational leaders, and my friends, making the necessary changes to reimagine a national theater ecosystem that includes and centers inclusion, diversity, equity, action, and that celebrates the multiplicity of artistic voices throughout history and now. But first, I'd like to introduce you to OSF associate producer, Ken Savage, the producer and the creator of this panel. Take it away, Ken. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Savage. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, and thank you so much for showing up and supporting the work of these artistic leaders who are standing on the shoulders of giants and paving new ways for the next generations of leaders to come. I'm honored and humbled to introduce you to these five panelists today. First, our moderator is Leslie Ishii, Artistic Director of Perseverance Theater in Alaska. Leslie is a connector in our theater community, having worked at and with regional theaters across the country, along with Art Equity, TCG, and the Consortium of Asian American Theater Artists, or KATA, of which she serves as board president. At OSF, Leslie is the founder of the API 2 times 2 New Works Residency, and has worked as a dramaturg, was a FAIR program recipient, and served as a co-facilitator of OSF's IDEA initiative. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Next, we have Maya Dralis, who is the Artistic Director of The Lark, an international theater laboratory based in New York City that is dedicated to supporting playwrights and stories that reflect the vibrancy and complexity of our world. Previously, May has held artistic positions at Milwaukee Rep, the Playwright Center, and the Public Theater. May is a fierce director of new plays, and at OSF, she helms the productions of Viet Gone by Queen Nguyen and The Way the Mountain Moved by Idris Goodwin. Next up, we have Snehal Desai, who is the artistic director of East West Players in LA the nation's premier Asian American theater company and one of the largest and, and, and one of the longest, excuse me, running theaters of color in the United States. Snehal is also a member of the Asian Pacific American Media Coalition. He serves on boards of Kata and TCG and teaches executive arts leadership at USC's graduate program in arts leadership. Welcome Snehal. We have Eric Ting, the artistic director at Cal Shakes in the Bay Area. Eric is a champion of new plays and innovative reimaginations of classics nationally and internationally. Prior to Cal Shakes, he was the associate artistic director at The Long Wharf. At OSF, Eric directed the world premiere of Between Two Knees by the 1491s, which was co-commissioned with New Native Theater. And finally, we have May Ann Teo the artistic director of Musical Theater Factory in New York City, where they develop change-making new musicals in a joyous collaborative community by artists who exist in the intersections of underrepresented groups. Mayan is a queer immigrant from Singapore making theater and film at the intersection of artistic, civic, contemplative practice. In 2015, Mayan was the Phil Killian Directing Fellow at OSF. Welcome back, man. I wanna thank all five of you for sharing your wisdom and time with all of us and our audiences all around the world who are tuning in on Facebook and on YouTube. 
There will be a Q&A near the end of the panel. So if anyone in the audience has any questions that they would like to ask this fierce panel of Asian artistic leaders, please drop your questions in the chat and I will pop back in at the end of this conversation to ask them. And now I pass it on to our moderator, Leslie Ishii, to dive in. Thank you so much, Ken, and thank you to Nataki and Oregon Shakespeare Festival for hosting this important conversation with these esteemed colleagues. Wow. Um, again, I'm Leslie Ishii, and I'm zooming in um, where I'm the artistic director of the honor and pleasure of serving there at Perseverance Theater. And we are here on the unceded lands of the Akkwam peoples on Klinkit Ani. Um, with that, I'd like to pass it to Mayan to get us started and introducing yourself and where you're zooming in from. Hi everyone, um, Mayan Tio, I'm zooming in from um, Muncie Lenape and Canarsie lands, um, also known as Brooklyn. Beautiful, thank you. And Eric, would you go next? Totally, thank you, Leslie. Uh, hey everybody, Eric Ting, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm actually also, I'm zooming in from down the street from Mayan um, on, uh, on unceded Munsee Lenape and Arzee lands. Uh, I run my theater though, California Shakespeare Theater is on unceded Chachonye speaking Ohlone lands in the Bay Area. So thank you. Great to be here. Great, great um, to have you. And May, would you go next, please? Sure. Uh, May Adrala, she, her pronouns. And I am zooming in uh, from Johns Island in South Carolina, which is the unceded land of the Kasubo and Kiowa. Mm. Beautiful, thank you. And Sneha Hall, I invite you to, to introduce yourself and where you're zooming in from. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Sneha Hall Desai, he, him, and I am calling in from the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people in Los Angeles. Yeah. Right, Los Angeles. Yes, thank you. Oh, I didn't mention that the um, the land of uh, Tlingit Ani is actually the colonially known as Juneau, Alaska. So you'll see, I always share my background there. Um, so we're from all over the country here. It's beautiful to see this representation geographically too. Um, but our conversation, breaking stereotypes, advancing Asian artistic leaders. Wow. So that begs the question, where do we come from? How do we get where we are? So can we take um, just a maybe a minute or two each to share what were your influence, your cultural, your social upbringing, that your role models that that helped to get you here, you know, uh, that leadership that you that you looked at, that you saw, were there qualities, were there influences that that still stay with you or that certainly got you going into this profession or just towards being a leader or an advocate even? Any, just a minute or two each, anybody care to share? I just kind of open it up to be a little organic here. Um, sure, I can share. Um, uh, my, I, I am the proud daughter of Filipino immigrants, uh, which shaped me and largely uh, shaped the kind of artist that I, um, I am today. Um, they uh, actually, through a series of events and also not of their own choice, left the country um, and ended up in a small rural area of Appalachia, Virginia. Uh, where I grew up. And um, I guess one of the things that has always stayed with me is just uh, their vision of community and uh, lifting up uh, those around them and equity. And they, uh, my, my father was a surgeon and my mom is a nurse. They established a medical practice and they actually also established the first free clinic um, in that region. And so they're, they're, um, they're, they, how they give back to the community is something that I think has shaped me and, and how I also, uh, though I went through a very different lens, despite their disappointment, um, and went to the arts. Um, but it's, it's also, uh, the, the lens that I use when I'm, uh, thinking of being in an artist service organization like the LARC. Mm, that's beautiful. And yes, congratulations. You're, you are now artistic director at the at the Lark. Beautiful, <laughs> lovely, great. I, beautiful to hear you carry your your parents and their values with you. Wonderful. Who'd like to go next? 
I'll go. Um, also immigrant uh, stock here. Um, I'm Chinese Singaporean. Um, and so that's a very particular thing in terms of like cultural and social upbringing. So like 24 hours flight away, I'm like the privileged class, right? And, and race. And then I come here and it's like a very different situation landing here when I was nine years old. And I wanna, I wanna look at my parents too. They're humble people. Um, they, my father will not be a pe preacher by trade would preach all the time. And so he, he was always like bringing the good word of the Lord into context for the people, his family, the, children. Um, and he was always synthesizing and trying to make a vision from what is there and always had this beautiful way of understanding what is like really deeply underneath that. Like that's just how he was like in the home. Um, and my mother started a nonprofit for children at risk underprivileged youth. So like my when I think about them, it's like not flashy at all. It is about what, not about what it looks like or sounds like. It's really about like seeing the massive iceberg underneath the tip of what leadership means mm. uh, when I think about them. And then just like holding up the artistic directors that I worked for, you know, Tony Ciccone, he brought the real. Bill Rausch, when I was at OSF, he brought the heart. And Shakina Nafak, who um, I followed at Musical Theater Factory, she, uh, had a gender confirmation surgery the same moment where she started musical theater factory and so she brought the pussy power that i step into every day awesome i love it i feel that fire in you from all your mentors is awesome and that heart too and again parents who wonderfully led with service wow beautiful who'd like to go next eric snehal i'll go um hey so i'm not sure I, i'm gonna forget all of the prompt but i'll just offer you know i am uh i'm first generation american born both of my parents come originally from mainland china and uh but i was born in grand forks north dakota and then raised in also in appalachia but in morgantown west virginia which is um just about 90 minutes south of pittsburgh and uh you know i think that I don't know. I was I was thinking about this question a little bit earlier, and I was I was uh, reflecting on my grandparents actually, because sort of you know I think that um, I think I think for a long time growing up, my life was sort of limited. It was like limited by the sort of time that my family came to this country, and um, over mm -hmm. about 10, 15 years, I was learning a lot about the lives of my grandparents uh, back in my twenties and back in my twenties and. Um, and so my grandparents come from my my mother's the story of my mother's mother is that she um, she was a doctor a psychiatrist but she got her medical degree in Berlin just before the Second World War broke out um, and then sort of settled in Hong Kong and the only reason she came to the U.S. was because she uh, met a, she met a Mormon missionary converted and then had a family sponsor her family to come to the U.S. Um, and then my father's parents were uh, part of the, well, they, they ran a, they had a, a, a sort of peasant militia during the Second World War. And they would go around, sort of a bunch of farmers on horses would go around blowing up um, Japanese munitions. And, um, and the story there was that uh, there was one night when they were running away and my grandmother who was carrying my father at the time who was a baby her horse reared up and she lost hold of my father and he landed in the tall grass and it was like nighttime and the japanese soldiers were kind of coming on the horizon with like torches and they couldn't light any lights and my father wasn't making any sound so um it was like just as they were getting ready to leave he finally cried out and they picked him up so um those are two moments mormons Mormons and tall grass that like lead to my being here today. <laughs> wow, Eric, my goodness. Uh, what an amazing story. I mean, y'all so far, I know say how you and I'll go, but already we're breaking stereotypes here. Who could have known all these incredible uh, backgrounds, right? Your, your legacies. Beautiful Snehal. Yeah, you can't wait to read everyone's memoirs. Oh my God, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, it's, it's, you know, I think I'm also first generation. My parents um, immigrated from India 
um, from the Western part in Gujarat. And I just want to take a second and just also um, send yeah. thoughts and prayers to those folks, to everyone in, in Asia, and particularly in India and Southeast Asia, right now still struggling with um, COVID-19 uh, and, and a new wave of it, as well as tomorrow is the one year anniversary of um, George Floyd and what happened yes. um, kind of uh, a year of reckoning since then. So I just want to take a second to bring those things into the room. Um, for me, you know, what's interesting is I used to mark some, you know, Western things that I saw as being the first moment that I was exposed to theater. But lately, I think about growing up, how it was actually kind of Indian dance drama that I would see at weddings or temples and things like that. But that was actually the first performance that I engaged in that I think really shaped me um, because Western Eastern storytelling traditions are more physical um movement based drama and storytelling versus eastern which is more text based um and i think that still has carried with me as well as the, the disjunction of growing up in a household and i'm i'm aging myself and maybe a few of, our, of, of you are with me but i grew up with you know like nirvana and the grunge movement and playing that but also hearing a bollywood movie as you go down the stairs and kind of growing up in these households that is a mesh of these traditions um, and to me, it was I became an artist to kind of sort that out as well as to kind of bring life to that experience because I didn't see that work or experience it growing up. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania called Quaker Town, um, which was the actual name, and my parents owned a gas station. So um, I lived the kind of the Apu stereotype for much of my um, early life. And so I think that also led me to want to change the narrative. Right, I knew what the power of art could be in a negative way, but what could it be in a positive way? Um, and the last thing is I want to lift up a common mentor of ours who is Tim Dang. And I think yes. Tim has played an instrumental role um, in shaping the lives of so many Asian American artists. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Sneha. Another East Coaster, wow. Yes, and, and certainly sending prayers to our um, South Asian family relatives cousins and um and our uh middle eastern north african um colleagues who have family too that uh may be struggling with peril there um thank you for that yeah um i'm fourth generation japanese american great grandparents grandparents parents community members our whole family uh incarcerated during world war ii and or forcibly removed um and there are many that are survivors and we had family that didn't survive the US concentration camps during World War II. And um, probably also that has certainly shaped everything because similar to May Ann and May's parents, um, my parents never forgot the, the generosity of folks in churches uh, when they finally could return to the West Coast and uh, they were homeless. So during resettlement, our whole community, largely in Seattle, the Japanese community, they're very passionate about uh, social service. And uh, still to this day, a lot of us take over where they left off with creating homeless projects and meal projects. So, um, and working with those churches still, the next generations to make sure that our most vulnerable are, are taken care of. So uh, that absolutely informs everything about being in community too. And um, then I want to lift up my great aunt who was a pioneer in modern dance in Seattle. Uh, she studied with Martha Graham and then worked with Eleanor King in Seattle. And um, so I, I had danced very young, very creative dance, and then danced through college at the University of Washington. In fact, I was a dancer and a musician before I ever became an actor. Um, so uh, just grateful for all those opportunities. Um, if it weren't for my auntie uh, having her own studio, which was really unique and uh, groundbreaking at the time in the university district, I'm not sure I would have had that opportunity. So just grateful for that. I too want to lift up um, those, you know, I was sharing with you all, we were kind of recounting that at this moment in time is probably the most Asian American Pacific Islander, Native Indigenous uh, folks who have come into leadership at PWIs. Before that, Che Yu and uh, Benny Sato Ambush um, after leaving the Oakland Ensemble and uh, and, and a few others, but certainly the, and then of course, like Tim Dang, all those who paved the way uh, 
Tisa. Tisa still continues with Pan-Asian Rep and Jorge. You know, so many of those folks who were founding artistic directors, um, amazing and, and set the path for us uh, throughout the West Coast, as well as throughout the country. Uh, Theater Moo and uh, Northwest Asian American Theater that's no longer with us. Um, and then all the, the folks in New York. Yeah, Ma Yi, 2G, incredible work, right? So thank you for those influences and lifting up those folks, those elders. Yes, Mia Akatikbak, thank you. And Rick Shiomi was the original, a founder of, of Theater Moo, fantastic. Um, and so with that, I just wanna get on. So thank you, there's a little context about who we are, what's influenced us. I wanna move to, to being artistic directors now. What have we learned? What do we need to unlearn? And, and uh, you know, what about those definitions of leadership? We've brought ourselves to it. We've had a path towards that. Um, but I have two questions first, just to take a little poll. How many at this time inherited a theater that was in debt? Yeah. It's rare, isn't it? These days, I think many of the BIPOC leaders have come into these uh, PWIs or historical PWIs have inherited tremendous debt or some kind of a uh, bit of turmoil. Yeah, and May, gratefully, I think um, the leaders there at the LARC were highly conscious of making sure they moved LARC to a good place, uh, a good health for the next leader, gratefully. Yeah. Um yeah, I think, uh, I mean, John Eisner was actually one of my mentors um, and shaped me. So, uh, yes, I'm, I, I'm grateful he's paved the foundation for us. Yes, beautiful. I know Michael Robertson had uh, some of that work to do before he left as well. So that that's wonderful to hear. And what a great model to set, right? Um, but I also want to get to, so, yeah, what were your influences? What did you learn, unlearn regarding taking the helm? And, but one more question, how many knew they wanted to be an artistic director before being in these positions? Or actually, some of you were associate artistic directors beforehand. For all of us, is this the first time being an artistic director? Yeah, okay. How many knew you wanted to be an artistic director? Any thoughts? May did, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, there, okay, so the rest of us, that wasn't necessarily the case, but we all did freelance for a while, right? Yeah, please, Eric, please chime I mean, in. I mean, when, <laughs> like, like, yeah. are you saying, like, while we, like, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be an artistic director. <laughs> at some point, so at some point it turned you went, I think I could do that or I'd like to try or No, you know, I just think I think I think because I was associate AD for so long, I just thought that's what you were supposed to do. And that's like I will say my answer to your question a little bit is like yeah. there's a ton of behavior to unlearn. And yeah. some of that just comes from being, you know, the majority of my career has been in legacy white institutions. And mm -hmm. if I'm really honest with myself, I mean there's a story that I like to tell Please. about my first encounter with Kata which was the, the conference that was held in Los Angeles. And this was actually in East West player space. And I remember Julia Cho, the playwright um, had invited me to join her on a panel. And we were on this panel just talking about like, I think we're talking about like working in, in, in predominantly white institutions. Um, and then Fred Ho, whose work I had just like, I had just started to get to, un to, to know and become familiar with um, who I'd never met um, at one point he raises his hand and he basically says, he basically tells me in that space in front of all these people that I've like barely known or, or not known that I didn't have a right to be there. And that like, who was I to be having this conversation as someone whose career had predominantly been in these very well funded, very well endowed cultural arts organizations. Like what was like, I didn't have a, he, he said that I didn't like, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It's been a while, but, um, but it's a it's a moment that I kind of carried I've carried with me ever since and it's uh and there's you know there's truth to it right there's like I think that I think that um, uh, my identity as a Chinese American is not necessarily a massive part of my identity as a theater artist 
Mm. And it, it hasn't shown up in that way in terms of my particular career path. And it's only, it's only really recently that um, I think as we've all sort of collectively struggled with an understanding of how white supremacy manifests itself in these institutions and in this art form um, that I've, I've begun to really kind of uh, reconcile that identity, those, these two identities. Um, so it's been, so there's, I, you know, the, my answer to you is like, there's just like, there's a lot of behavior that's learned behavior. That's like, oh, this is like, if you do this thing, this is the path that you're supposed to take, or, you know, like, this is, this is how you cast a show, or this is how you, this is what a director's role is. And this is the sort of all of those, all of these questions that I think we keep interrogating right now. It's a lot of behavior that I think I, I'm working on unlearning. Mm, mm-hmm. I want to jump off of that because like I don't I didn't even conceive of myself as being able to be an artistic director because I was very scared about fundraising and I felt like because I don't come from a rich family that there would be no way I could a start a thing on my own or b be able to have access to the pockets that make American theater run right like I, like there's so many things that i was headhunted for that i was like i don't think i can actually do that because the only way to save that theater is to walk in with a million dollars in your pocket right and like i i would i would see all these things and i would go and and i really i really didn't think it was possible for me at all the only asian woman artistic director that I had direct contact with was Yuriko Doi, who started Theater of Yugen. And at that point in time where I had, she was, she was like leaving it. So I didn't even have the, the uh, benefit of sort of being at that theater as an associate artist during the time she was there. Um, I just knew her, you know, um, and, and I think like that, it wasn't even possible. It didn't, it didn't feel like an actual track. So I, I stayed in education for a long time because of that. And at some point people just kept saying like, you talk a lot of these conferences, why aren't you an artistic director? And I'm like, well, cause I don't raise money and blah, blah, you know, like, I, like all of those things. And so I never actually participated in the structure of American theater, because like Eric said, I didn't feel like there was a space for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually feel there was a space for me at all um, until, you know, I, 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 I started being an artistic director at MTF. Um, but I, I think that there are so many of these like strata that are, I love, I love that is like breaking stereotypes, breaking stereotypes of like the fact that all of us are here and that we look the way we do with the histories that we do and we're taking the helm is, mm -hmm. is a really exciting moment in time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll jump in from that. And you know, what's, um, what Maine was saying when I was graduating and I wanted to have a career. Oh, someone okay. to mentor you. Um, and they, and I said, okay, great. How do I find a mentor? And they were like, well, uh, mentors tend to mentor people who look like them or remind them of themselves. So you should find a, a South Asian artistic director if that's what you want to do. So I was like, great, let me look for a South Asian artistic director in the country. And, you know, I came up short. And at that time, it's also because the places I was working out of were very white. So they didn't know Mina or Dipankar or the guy, you know, the Silk Road, Malik. So they didn't know that there were, and nor did I. Um, so I looked abroad. So I con connected with Jatinder Verma at Tara Arts in London, and I would see him over a number of summers, and he was wonderful to meet with me. And it was so interesting to be um, South Asian there because the, the history of the Indian population, the, the size, all of that is very, very different in terms of the culture. Um, and then when I would go there, as soon as you open your mouth, you're not, you know, South Asian or Indian American, you're American, right? Because of your the, the accents count so much there. And mm -hmm. so I just was looked at it as a different way in terms of an artist. Um, and, I, and I ultimately, you know, though all of, you know, was able to find people who wanted to mentor folks who didn't look like them. I think May and I share uh, a mentor with Elizabeth, with Liz Diamond. You know, there are folks there who want that and that just needs to continue to happen more and more. Um, but for me, it was uh, ultimately also finding that social justice mattered to me in my art making, right? So in terms of the statements that I wanted to make 
as well as who the audience was. And that was why New York didn't necessarily feel like a, a, a fit for me because that audience oftentimes is a rarefied elite theater going audience in New York. You don't necessarily know who the you know, community is that you serve with the work um, or you have to find them and bring them in into the city. Um, and so for me, it was as soon as I found that intersection of art and social justice that I began to look at more culturally specific institutions and seeing the work being done there. Um, and then also being see, seeing the double standard, right? If something has a social justice component, it is often frowned upon in the larger industry as being didactic or activist or all of that, you know, those kind of things. Um, whereas a lot of the art I see that at these other institutions is what I saw in, in grad school, which was navel gazing, right? It was all like, in, it was like, look at me, let me, let me, it's a competition to see who can make the audience suffer the most versus who can make the audience engage the most with the experience, um, you know, and, and transformative of an experience. So I think those were things that, uh, it took a little bit of bumping around, you know, to, to find my, to find institutions that were doing the work that I wanted um, and how that looked very different than being at a, at PWI or a Lord, right? It wasn't the size of the theater um, and the money it had that, you know, ultimately for me was a hallmark of making a difference with the art. Mm. I, I'm, I, I, I'm just so responsive and so much of what you all have said, it's really sparked with me, but so much unlearning to do. Um, I just, I, I wanted to be an artistic director really since grad school because I realized that person can say yes and can actually shift what we're gonna see on stage. And I wanted to be that person. And because shortly before I went to grad school, you know, I had this captivating experience where I actually saw my family and myself represented on stage. And it wasn't until I moved to New York and saw, you know, Jessica Hagedorn's dog eaters. And I was so moved by it because I recognized everybody. And I looked around and I recognized, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, I just come from, you know, uh, Virginia. It was like the most Asians I'd ever seen in my life, you know, aside from like <laughs> a family reunion. And I realized that, um, you know, after that elation was done, I realized like, oh my God, I, when other people see O'Neill, when other people see Miller, when other people see that, then they have that experience all the time. And so mm -hmm. this art form, which I am setting my path, you know, I'm, I'm walking towards, um, I, I had this realization that it, there was no place for me yet. And then I found out about this position that exists. <laughs> <laughs> proverbially and I was like I'm gonna do that and I I'm gonna make um whoever is is not historically represented I'm going to make them historically represented and and change who we're going to see and the stories that we understand to be to be reflective of us and that's kind of where the fire comes. And I'm so excited that this is the, these are the leaders that I'm leading that change mm. with. Um, and uh, along with Nataki at OSF, um, but that is, um, that's why I'm here. And it's not easy. There are so many things that I have to unlearn about just who I am as an artist and how like Eric have been following the model of um, what it is, you know, what, what that white supremacist model is, and also recognizing my own, um, you know, coming from an immigrant family, my parents came and lived the American dream. They are the American dream, but with that, they also um, inherited a lot of the, I, the, the white supremacy that comes with that perceived American dream. And I am also perceiving of that just, you know, uh, and by growing up with those values. So I'm unlearning so much of that and trying to rediscover and make more room for my authentic self and the work that I do and also how I lead. Mm, that's powerful, uh, May, beautiful. Um, just to add a little context to the word or the terms um, forced assimilation always comes to mind for me because and to know that in the histories of those earliest immigrants chinese japanese filipino that came through and the labor 
we were forced into social control, which is white supremacy, right? So the Japanese forced to give up their language in camp much like natives who were stolen and put in boarding school and forced to give up their languages. So as folks came in after that, our families kept immigrating, uh, that, that sense of needing to um, kind of conform, to get along, to get along better, have find success, find some level of um, ability to, to be here and live and thrive. Uh, just, I, I never forget that that's underlying, yeah. Mm-hmm. Eric, did you have a thought? I felt I I felt you lean in a little. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I I was just, I mean, I think, I think, I think just to, I think yes to what you just said, and then also to name that like many people got very good at that. Absolutely, yes. Right, and so like, and I think it's an interesting conversation. I mean, listen, like this identity is such a a stupidly large diaspora that like just includes way too many. Like, it's hard to it's hard to make any kind of general statement. Um, so it's like I can only really ever just speak for myself. But I think like this notion of this notion of white adjacency is a real thing. Yeah. And I think especially on the eve of George Floyd's of the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like so important to be able to name that privilege and how that privilege shows up, um, even in like the sheer number of like AAPI leaders that are like, that have been like given this opportunity. Um, you know, it's, and I think, I think what's interesting, the question that I keep coming back to is sort of like, you know, how do we, like, how do we name, how do we name things like that? How do we name that privilege without apologizing for it? Like, it's not like, it's again, it's a condition or it's a system that we're all part of. And so how do we, how do we acknowledge like, like, how do we hold all of these truths that you're describing, right? Which is the, like the conditions that created the space where our parents worked very hard to ensure that we were able to navigate, right? This country and the society of this country, like by giving us mm-hmm. English names, you know, by, by, by like my, my parents, I, I used to speak Cantonese until I was five. And then my parents, when I started kindergarten, decided that the best way for me to learn English was to like, like drop all Cantonese cold. And so there was like, I think there was like, I think there was a good three months when I didn't understand a single thing my parents were saying to me. So, but they did that. And, 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 and that has afforded me opportunities. And, um, and I just want to, I think it's important to name that because I think it's like, I think that, um, yeah, I just want to, I'm, I'm looking for how we can sort of, how we can talk about leadership in a way that is, that holds both the legacies that have brought us here mm-hmm. um, and also simultaneously recognizes, you know, the inequity, the inequities that have brought us here. And like, and, and how does, how do we hold responsibility for that, for all of that? Absolutely. I think at woven in, like you're saying, Eric, is a, a, an adaptability that, created a positive survival on some level, right? Not without it's what we call now weathering, the difficulties of what we weather, our body, minds, and spirits weather, but there is adaptability that we're, we're known for in many ways, yeah. Sneha, you have a thought, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, well, I just wanted to, you know, the other thing is a lot of us are coming from former colonies, right? Our families are coming, yeah. so it's, there's a compounding, if you're coming from the Philippines or if you're coming from India, already of a country that was a colony and then coming over here so that this all of this goes back generations and this it's you know so much of it has been set up as a patriarchal you know colonized model against groups in our own you know native countries um and then this monolith of asian and asian american as you come here um but you know to me you know what what eric was saying a lot of it comes with first of all just getting to the place where we question everything that is the pre-established norm, right? Like we question this behavior that is when you go into a theater, you are quiet, you sit back, you don't, you know, like these modes of being together that aren't actually the modes of being that the way our communities gather, right? So, you know, oftentimes we talk about um, how, you know, uh, the rules for being in a black church on Sunday are different than being in the theater, but yet, you know, there isn't an acknowledgement of how did those structures get set up? And also then who were, 
and really blowing open the doors on who the gatekeepers have been for so long. Um, you know, who defined what a classic was, who lifted, you know, Shakespeare above Kalidasa or any of these things. So that I think we are in that moment. And that's what our artists continue to need to do, as well as artistic leaders, is if nothing else questioning everything that is kind of a foregone norm. Um, you know, why can't we, why can we not eat in theaters, right? Like when food is center to so many of our cultural traditions and our ways of bonding. And yet we're all like, you know, I mean, you can't bring theater in because the space is actually dictating the culture versus the people in the, in the venue. So I think that's, um, we're definitely at that moment. And this is the moment also to make those changes before we reopen. Right now is the time to reorganize all of that and welcome and enter audiences and enter into a new world. The worry is if you don't do that now and we open that there's going to be kind of a nostalgia to go back to the way they things were before. Absolutely, we know we that it, especially with white supremacy uh, patterns and oppression, it just defaults back if you don't stay in there. Right to interrogating, doing something different or new. Absolutely. Um, uh, and to your point, Eric, I think there's a way that we keep naming the legacy of how we've been pitted against each other, but continue to be iterative and look for all those ways we can be, uh, you know, uh, in solidarity and defy those patterns of oppression. Yeah. Um, um, Brianne, please. And then yeah. we'll go on to another question. Thank you. So I was, I, I was so lucky to be involved in the BIPOC leadership circle that was held by Art Equity. Um, and I was also the first cohort at OSF in 2015 of Art Equity. So it's right. been such a powerful uh, uh, learning force, Carmen Morgan, in, in, in my journey. And just being able to, in that space, be able to ask ourselves what we're per perpetuating. Yeah, and do you know I mean? like that was that was really phenomenal for us to be able to like ask ourselves <laughs> in that space with each other and start to identify the things that we have been um, that we have learned about what leadership looks like, what are we putting forward, what are the values that are often upheld. Uh, it required so much like deep internal and personal reflection and contemplation um, that 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 I was really grateful for in trying to figure out you know, um, what and how are we like, I'm really moved by what Snehal said about these modes and what Eric said about like, how can we acknowledge that privilege as well. And I think about the moment when I was at the at um, one of the one of the katas, and uh, there were two black women who were like sitting next to me. And I remember, like talking with them. And I was like, thank you for coming. <laughs> I was like, thank you for coming. Thank you for thinking this is important you know and then being at the latinx commons and one of my friends we were talking about the the monolith of latinx and like latinx at all and all of that and my friend turned to me and he said you know this kind of feels like skeletons in the closet and like what do you think when you like hear this and i was like we deal with the same thing in asian like what is asian mm -hmm. as a monolith and I think that those like being in community and really having conversations of support and understanding that the complexities are different and also um, similar throughout the ways in which we are uh, re-indigenizing and decolonizing, yeah. um, there's so many things we can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, I want to invite Ken back on. I know, Ken, I think you have a question for us, don't you? Yes, I have a question from the audience. Um, so for all of the panelists, knowing that the four or five of you walked into institutions that were already carrying debt and knowing that that's not really setting y'all up for success, what would you want to see from your company or a company in general when walking in the door of an artistic directorship to feel as though you're actually being set up for success? Ah. Great question. Very good question, because we want to actually also be preparing to leave our organizations at some point, someday, in good health and set up the next person for success. Absolutely. Any thoughts? We can also popcorn and brainstorm here, too. But you probably have dreamt about this anyway. You probably have some thoughts. I, 
I will, this, this isn't exactly about the uh, a deficit, but I do think that um, if you're preparing to go into an artistic director role, that uh, one of the things you should be aware of is if the, um, the values that are set out by that theater and how they are enacted in culture and in practice and in activities. Um, and to really examine that to see everyone falls short, but see where it's falling short and, and, um, and how are you going to meet that? And if those values are exactly aligned with your own core values. Um, I think it's just important just to set that foundation because I, I find that, um, you know, with with the finances, there are its own um, its its own uh, uh, you know headache and and distress. Um, but it's something that's somewhat uh, practical in my mind. But it's the other thing of just historically where this this organization has sat and um, how true it's been to its values and um, how are you going to take that forward. So I think in leaving your seat it's important to um, just stay true to what your, your stated values are um, and uh, work towards them truly without it being, not necessarily using the, the organization as a microphone, but really living it. So that would be my response. I think May nailed it. I think you have to go in more than anything knowing who you are and knowing where your values are. Um, and there should be, you know, if you're taking over the helm, there should be hopefully alignment in the values between the organization and yourself. Otherwise it is gonna be a, a struggle. And then just kind of being clear on message of this is who I am and this is what my top priorities are. You kind of have to do that. The other thing is, you know, um, you're gonna be, one of the things I think about is when you go in, has the organization been prepped for and ready and is welcoming of change? So that oftentimes you're following someone and you know people that may not have wanted them to leave, but they are moving on for a variety of reasons. And there, some people really fear change, right? They fear that, that which is an inevitable part of it. And so um, have they been set up and are they welcoming and opening to change? Because otherwise, everything is going to be a little bit of a struggle. Um, I talk about my first show I opened as artistic director, which was programmed by my predecessor. I was already on staff at East West. Um, you know, we kind of just picked up operations. All of the team was the same, the staff, nothing had changed in the building. Um, and the first performance, someone walked in and was like, everything's different. And I was like, literally nothing is different, but in their mind, everything had shifted because the leader who had been there for 20 years, um, who was their point of connection was gone. And there was just this fear of like, will I be seen? Will I be looked at? Um, and so if, if that conversation has been set up well, then you're gonna be in a really good position. Um, and then the other thing is that they are prepared for an interaction of the system. You know, the thing you're gonna run into here the nonprofit, right? Like there's huge structural inequities and issues with the nonprofit model. And, you know, I hope as a leader coming in now, you may challenge or question that, uh, which oftentimes means challenging or questioning the board. Um, and are, are folks ready for that? Have you talked about it yourself during the interview process? Have the consultants or the headhunters opened up those conversations? Because I think those things are going to be key on top of a financial base, right? A little bit of a cushion um, from which to operate from. I couldn't agree more, Snehal. I'm gonna say this. Any theater that's looking for a new leader right now, do not even dare to ask the, what do you do about diversity, you know, equity and inclusion question, unless you're really willing to back that up. You don't even get to ask the question unless you're really willing to back that up because time and time again what happens is we're going to ask the question you're going to tell us how to solve it oh we're scared and we won't hire you because we're not actually really willing to change so you don't even get to ask the question unless you're ready for it so i have another question from the audience from jessica prudencio fabulous director as well 
Jessica says, I feel so honored to hear you all this evening. Thank you. I see friends, colleagues, and strong leaders continuing the legacy of persistence set up by your families and ancestors. Her question is, do you ever have moments of self-doubt in this leadership position? If so, how do you work that through that as you rise? So I've been artistic director since late 2015, and I would say every single day. I don't have a number on that. My math is not good enough for it. But um, um, and I think sometimes it's sort of like what's funny about it. I mean, I think that's. I mean, I think that's part of leadership. I think a little bit part of leadership is actually um, taking on that that sense of uncertainty and that kind of vulnerability. Um, and I find, I find personally that the, the best thing that I have learned to do um, is to not, um, to not shy away from that. So that uncertainty, that discomfort, that um, fear, uh, that w when I have achieved a thing, when I have felt successful, it is because I leaned into it. Um, it is because I pushed through it. Um, and I would say I failed as often as I succeeded, but, um, but I tried. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you, Eric. I, I don't think there's a day. I mean, to answer my own question, I wasn't actually intending to be an artistic director. I've been freelance for decades, but called to service. So if I think about being called to service, I don't have to know everything. I just have to have a great, like they say, put a great team around you. And I inherited a, a wonderful team. And um, uh, yeah, the vulnerability that you're talking about is so palpable. And the, um, the need to say, I don't know. And so that began us decentralizing the hierarchy. And now we actually have task force and we work very horizontally. So nobody is burdened with having to know everything in that kind of old trope, if you will, that old system. And we, we, we see where departments overlap and we help each other. So we even refer to each other on emails as the team rather than the director of, and we know people hold titles and respect that and all that they bring to their positions, but we've started to really deconstruct and um, it's slow and, but it, and it's not perfect for sure. Um, and with uh, three indigenous humans on our staff, it's been beautiful to get the great honor and privilege of native wisdom around governance that is very much about caring for the community, feeling like you're really cared for and that you're really bringing each other along. So uh, I, I can't, if I'm called into service, I'm so grateful it's here. Um, as far as being set up for success, uh, if we can keep that growing, that kind of uh, uh, level of, of uh, horizontalness and moving forward together, I think whoever comes next will be set up for success in any of our positions, you know? Um, and I pray that this team stays together. <laughs> I would also share that I think it's important going forward that you work hard. Unfortunately, I can say I was harassed. I, I was accosted a little over, uh, just a week before the Atlanta shootings. So that is what turned my board to committing to be an anti-racist board. I pray that none of this has to ever happen to any of you or any theater, that that is what turns. But knowing what's happening in society now, please get on board, get training, start to be an anti-racist board, anti-oppression board. It's, it's critical for the times we live in. Or roll off and make, room, make space for folks who are willing to put justice first. Yeah. Otherwise, we're constantly in systems that literally systematically dehumanize. So it's really critical that we move forward now, anti-racist, towards our liberation and justice so that all the intentions that these beautiful leaders have shared can come to fruition because that is the intention is to see us as fully human all the time, moving toward everyone's liberation. 
that's to me what it looks like to set up success. Yeah. Oh, Ken has one last question. So friends, what advice would you give to aspiring artistic directors and what skills do you recommend they cultivate, including donor strategies, management, et cetera? What advice and what skills? I'll just continue connected to the last the, um, question as well, is that there is no, you know, it, it, it's like, I think everyone here is also a director. There's no book on how to direct. Like ultimately you can read anecdotal things, but it, it's not, the learning happens when you're in those positions. And in some ways, what I think about is I'm writing my own book as I go so that as I make mistakes in the future, I'm looking back on those moments. You know what I mean? And you're learning how to just attack things in a different way. We also live in a time where um, you're gonna be, as a leader, you're gonna be called out publicly. Oftentimes you, you don't even know, like, you know what I mean? It, the communication is very different. So rather than folks sometimes coming to you with something or you hearing it, you it, it, it's on social media first. And I think when that stuff, you have to be prepared and really, again, know who you are and what you stand for. And also know what are they gonna, have systems in place to tackle those issues as they are brought to your attention. Um, because inevitably it's going to happen and not everyone, you're not going to be able to make everyone happy. And I think that's the other big thing is who do you as an artistic leader, who do you as an organization, I hate the table analogy, but want in the room and who is it okay to say this room or this table may not be for you anymore, um, which is super hard and super messy, especially when money gets involved. Um, but I think those are things that are going to come up. But the other thing is just, there is no one path but get as much experience in all these different areas, um, as Mayim said, in fundraising, in special events. But um, you know, the main thing is you're not gonna be able to do everything before you get into these positions. You'll learn on the job, but it's how the vision you have of yourself, and as Leslie was saying, the what liberation theology you adhere to or believe in for yourself and your community is important. I'd say also, if it is what you have been called to, trust that your life that you've lived will bring you there. So I have a finance degree from undergrad and I hid that for most of my life because no one wants to hire a director with a finance degree. Um, but when I applied for the job, I actually put it in the first time I put in any cover letter that I have a finance undergraduate degree. And at, at the search committee, they actually mentioned, you have a finance degree and an international tour, blah, blah, blah. We're so excited about you. And I called my mom and I said, hey, mom, you know, because like I have a finance degree because I'm a good Chinese daughter. All right. That's like the only reason. And so I was like, OK, like, mom, guess what happened? This is what happened. I debriefed with them. I told her and I said they loved that. And she said, you have me to thank. So thank your parents. Listen to them. Be good Asian children. It'll all work out. Anybody else? Are we ready to close, Ken? I don't want to hold you. No, anyone else have any final pieces of advice for aspiring artistic directors out there? I would say, especially those in our BIPOC community, our family and friends, you know, continue to heal your own internalized oppression. It's critical. It will also lead you to the most beautiful inspirations and how to be working in collaboration in coalition with each other to lift up our, as, as Natakia, uh, as you always say, lift up all boats, right? Rise together. And that's one of the main things you can do. It'll help you have the insight and vision for the organization, but also for you artistically. Yeah. And you do right by your ancestors and your elders as you continue to heal too. It's empowering. Thank you, Leslie. Well, thank you so much to the five of you for sharing your time and your wisdom with all of us this evening. Leslie, Mayan, Eric, Snehal, and May, you are all inspirations to me. I remember as a, as a younger theater director and aspiring artistic director myself, 
that I was really looking for as many mentors as possible growing up. And I see mentors in each of you and in so many folks before you and in our uh, current peers um, across the country. So thank you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of OSF from sh for sharing your time uh, and honesty and heart with the American theater and the international theater to create a really vibrant place and safe space and brave space for those like me and those who come after all of us uh, to feel like we belong. So thank you. This wraps up our conversation, Breaking Stereotypes, Advancing Asian Artistic Leaders, produced by OSF in collaboration with Perseverance Theater, Musical Theater Factory, Cal Shakes, East West Players, The Lark, and Kata, the Consortium of Asian American Theater Artists. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to these wonderful thinkers and artists. If you liked what you saw, please continue to share this video with friends and family in your various networks. It'll be left online to be rewatched and reshared all over. And we're really looking forward to bringing all of us together, either virtually or in person in safe ways soon to share community and share one another's love for theater and the arts. So thank you everyone, have a good night and we'll see you all soon.